good evening, and on behalf of the revolution, welcome. And so I don't know whether or not I have a, a room full of, uh, of loyalists. I prefer the term loyalist over Tory. That's such a negative term. Actually, I prefer the term, I pref uh, are we okay to start? I just jumped in on this. I, I prefer the, uh, the phrase imperial patriot. I think that's a little more elegant. I'll get back to that in, in a little bit. And tonight, you know, tonight we're talking about the fabled battle of Bunker Hill, which never took place on Bunker Hill. It took place on Breed's Hill. And there's a reason for that strategic change and also for that geographic, that geographic mistake in, in all of our history books. But before we get you know, to the Battle of Bunker Hill and what came after it, we need to talk about what preceded it. There are always antecedents to an event as we step back here many, many, many years later, centuries later, that appears to be such a turning point and in an, an, an important way to describe and to roll out the American Revolution. So the antecedent to the Battle of Bunker Hill goes all the way back, and I'll be brief here because I want to make sure we have our storyline complete tonight. It goes all the way back to Parliament. And in March of 1774, Bunker Hill is in June 16th, 17th of 1775. In March of 1774, the, <clears throat> the British Parliament had had it with their rambunctious behavior of Bostonians. Boston always had a reputation as being a mobbish town. That was their phrase, a mobbish town. And, and his, his Majesty George III and just about every single member of Parliament had had it with this mobbish town and with the destruction of the tea in December of 1773. So in the months following the Boston Tea Party, and what a terrible name. It makes it sound as if a couple of tea bags, you know, went into the Atlantic Ocean. It sounds like something out of Alice in Wonderland. I mean, it was a major act of vandalism. Almost a quarter of a million dollars worth of tea was destroyed. And it sounds as if someone dropped a teapot in Boston Harbor. Well, it was more than that. And the king, his ministers in Parliament, had had it with the, with the mobbish behavior of Boston. And from that came a measure that was passed in Parliament unanimously. And the title is rather innocuous. It, it carries no threat. And the title was the Boston Port Bill. Sounds like no big deal. The Boston Port Bill. But the Boston Port Bill, in, in, in the main, did two things. I mean, there are a number of ancillary items as well. But the Boston Port Bill announced two changes. One is that the Port of Boston would be closed and sealed off by His Majesty's Navy until someone or someones paid for the destroyed tea. And we're talking in today's terms millions of dollars. Benjamin Franklin, you know, sending a, a, a message from, from London made it clear that you have really twisted the lion's tail now. You know, whomever is responsible for this, he knew. And that his best advice was pay it up because the, it's, it's only going to get worse. Come up with it and pay down the, the $325,000 worth of destroyed tea. The other piece that came from this, and this sets the stage for Bunker Hill, will be that Thomas Hutchinson, the last royal governor of, of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, will be fired. Now, Hutchinson was not a bad guy. I mean, Hutchinson's family went all the way back to the early settlement of Boston in 1634. And he was in a tough spot. He is, he's getting paid by the king. His, his job is to maintain order in the Mass Bay Colony, which was just a raucous group of troublemakers who found fault with everything. And he understood, at least intellectually, that he could have a private conversation off page, if, if you will, that this is not to be cited, this is not, this is not to be quoted. I understand your position, you know, taxation without representation. I understand that. You know, I understand what later on, and this is a great phrase from one of the former uh, directors of the Library of, of Congress, you know, Daniel Boston, 
who was a prolific and thoughtful author, that he put together a wonderful essay that you ought to read, and it's simply called The Therapy of Distance. It's an interesting word, The Therapy of Distance, that the American colonies, and certainly the Mass Bay Colony, 3,000 miles from Great Britain, and those 3,000 miles were a lot longer than they are today. It would take four, six, eight weeks, depending on tide and weather and so forth, that on this side of the Atlantic, certainly in Massachusetts, that we had grown accustomed to making decisions on our own, that we had grown accustomed to working through our local colonial legislatures, and that we had taken pride in the ability to govern ourselves, confidence in our ability to govern ourselves, and that as men and women of the Enlightenment, that the Lord has given us enough courage and sensibilities and intelligence and patience to be able to govern ourselves and what had happened over time that there had been a slow weaning away from the need for a British protection. Now imperial patriots would argue that we've got the best deal going and they did and that's what Hutchinson would say that you here in North America, you here in, 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 in the Massachusetts Bay Colony you are, you are the freest people in the world. Most of you can vote. The, the privilege of voting is limited to less than 5% of those in Great Britain. That you have property, that you are prosperous, that this is the greatest empire since Rome. You have all the rights that any English subject would wish to have. What's the complaint over taxation without representation? It doesn't make sense in, in Great Britain. You are represented. And Hutchinson understood the, the nuances of that argument. But I work for the king, and I'm unable to maintain order. And that tea went in the harbor, and I've been fired. And I'm returning to England to collect my Social Security and my Medicare. I made that up. <laughs> replacing, replacing Thomas Hutchinson will be General, General Gage, Thomas Gage. And as we, you know, as we read through Philbrick, and if you did not, you need not to, that General Gage, both in the Philbrick book and elsewhere, General Gage, number one, was not eager to return to North America. Uh, that he was home, he had three children in school, that he was, he was married, married to a, a colonial, he was married to a woman from New Jersey, Margaret Kimball, who wished to return. She missed her family. And now suddenly he finds himself, finds himself in the cockpit of a standoff between the Mass Bay Colony and the Empire. And his job is very simple. His job is to quash the uprising or to quash the unrest and to bring order to the Mass Bay Colony. And the reason I mentioned to you that, and I, ver and I did this specifically, it's the Boston Port Bill. Now, T ships were sent to Philadelphia, and they were sent to Charleston, and they were sent to New York, and, and in all of these towns, in all of these cities, the royal governors, or those who made the decision, turned the tea away. Only in Boston was it to be landed, and only in Boston, and because Hutchins said, bring it in. I want to maintain order. I want to show I'm, I'm in control of the situation. So only in Boston, did the tea get pitched. So only Boston will be punished, the Boston Port Bill, that we are going to have a general now in charge to maintain order. And he was in a tough spot. And he didn't have enough troops, frankly. He had maybe five or 6,000 soldiers. And being a British redcoat, boy, that was the job of last resort in terms of pay. A chimney sweep in London made more pay than a British soldier. It was a job of last resort. The, the pay was lousy, as I said. You know, discipline was harsh. Uh, the grub was lousy. And that's a word we use from louse that comes from lice and louse being on your body. And, and, he's, uh, and he's overmatched here, and he knows it. So, but I need a strategy to maintain order. So as he thinks about the situation and talks with his subordinates, and I'm thinking specifically of Lord Percy, General Percy, and Lieutenant Colonel Smith, who will lead the expedition out to Lexington and Concord, that what Gage wants to do is to turn down the tension. He wants to take the pressure off because the pressure has been building in Boston for years. 
and it, it burst out in the Boston Tea Party. So here's my plan. My plan is to disarm the colonials. There were thousands, tens of thousands, of Bostonians and those across the Mass Bay Colony, which extended out into Maine as well, who were imperial patriots. They were loyal English subjects. And what tied all of them together was their loyalty to the king and the fact that this was the most liberal and prosperous and greatest empire since that of Rome. We have all the rights we need, and we are the least taxed people in the world, and we are proud of being members of the British Empire. Gage knew that he had eyes and ears among the Boston community, and Boston was simply riddled with spies on both sides of the aisle. And the word was out from, from his network as he networked out into Boston and into Salem and Dorchester and Roxbury, where are the weapons being hidden? Where are the arms caches? And his plan was to identify where they were, have a map, if you will, and then to, on a Sunday morning, when everybody was in Sabbath in church, and that made him a, a villain, you see, or whenever he could pull a raid off, to go up to Marblehead, to go to Salem to maybe take a shot across Boston Neck into, into Roxbury or into Cambridge and to seize where the weapons are stored and bring them back to Boston, disarm the loyalists, and eventually the situation will blow over. Well, it did not. What it did, it enraged folks. And so the weapons, the arms caches, were pulled back deeper into the countryside, into Lexington, into Concord into Worcester. No one would dare march to Worcester, and certainly Gage would never dare to march to Lexington and Concord. Would he? Would he dare march 20 miles into the wilderness, swarm with armed men? Would he dare do that? And Gage thought about that, and Gage received information from a patriot who had a change of heart, his name was Dr. Benjamin Church. And in fact, Dr. Benjamin Church was, until he was found out as being a closet traitor, if you will, uh, Dr. Benjamin Church was the, the first, if you will, Surgeon General you know, for, the, for the Continental Army, you know, that he was Washington's right-hand guy in terms of providing medical care for the Army. And there's a long reason, which I don't want to get into, because we'll never get to Bunker Hill, as to why he changed sides. And in return for money, in return for gold, Gage always paid in cash. That's the best way. Uh, no American Express, no IOU. The check's in the mail. He paid in cash. And Gage, a trusted member of the Sons of, Loyal, of, of, of Sons of Liberty, gave him a map to show where weapons and so forth were, were housed, both in Lexington, but more importantly, in Concord. That, you know, with the exception of Worcester, this was, the, this was the, uh, the, the armament center, if you will, of the Mass Bay Colony. And so Gage is going to risk sending out a detachment of 700 men under Lieutenant Colonel Smith. And Smith was told, this is a milk run. It'll be easy. And when you return, and make sure you're here by daylight, don't get caught out on the open road. There'll be trouble that you're done and you're retiring back to your estate in, in England. So this is a milk run. This is his last deployment. And it's helping out General Gage, who was a good guy. General Gage wanted to bring peace. He was not a troublemaker. He was not arrogant. He was not aggressive. He was not assertive. He was not, he was not full of bloodlust. I don't even want this job. But I'm in the service of the king. And my duty is to my king. So, so Lieutenant Colonel Smith is told to handpick the men he wants to train and to, and to, and to pick, cherry pick the best troops and the best officers from the available troops here in Boston and train on Boston Common and plan for a night raid sometime in April when the roads begin to dry out a little bit and they're not as icy, you know, and the men can march quickly. And the words are, here's the map. When you get to Lexington, you know, grab what you can. 
but more importantly, when you, as more importantly, when you get to Lexington, and, and this is information that is getting cold in my hand as I have it, I have it for Benjamin Church that these two guys that I've been unable to find for months and arrest are, high, are hiding in Lexington at the Reverend Clark's house. And I want you to grab John Hancock and Samuel Adams. They're there, arrest them and bring them back, and I'm going to send them to London. They are two of the absolute ringleaders. Let's cut this off right at the, right at the head. And, we'll, and let's grab Samuel Adams, who was always trouble. He was an absolute thorn in the side to Hutchinson and now to General Gage. And to grab John Hancock. And then since you're out there, get out to Concord, and here's where the stuff is. Get in there, destroy it, and get back by daybreak. Whatever, whatever you do, or whatever you don't do, do not get caught on the open road. The roads will be swarming with militiamen. These, 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 these men are armed and dangerous. They're crack shots, and they'll be troubled. This is a, this is a, a nighttime raid. Uh, to use an old term, this is a search and destroy mission. Get out there, get back by daylight. There'll be trouble if you're not. Aye, aye. And these are armies of the 18th century. Two things. Everyone in Boston knew something was up because it was clear you know, that, that units were being pulled out of their regiments, that they were being redeployed on Boston Common, uh, that there was training. And the only question is, the only question was, when are they going to leave? Sometime in April. And will it be one of by land or two of by sea? Which meant in 1775, by land, are uh, they going to march over Boston Neck? And if one looks at an old colonial map of Boston, Boston is really an island. And it's almost, it's almost as if the Boston Neck was only a few hundred yards wide. And Boston, it's almost an um, uh, umbilical cord that is connecting Boston to the hubbub and the prosperity of a Cambridge and a Roxbury and Dorchester and so forth. So one of by land meant is Gage marching over Boston Neck or two if by sea, is he, is he going over the back bay and to reorganize every, everyone at Leachmere's point, and I know you all remember Leachmere's, and then to march up Mass Ave, the, 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 the great road as quickly as possible. And of course it's, what did Paul Revere see? He saw two lanterns, didn't he? And, and the mission was compromised also. This is an army of the 18th century, and it took time to move all these men at night in boats across the back bay, and then to reorganize and, and to straighten out the units. These are men that are unaccustomed to serving with one another and with some of these officers. So it took time to straighten out the mess. And uh, any of you that have been in the military, there's an expression, snafu. Do you know the expression? Uh, it's an acronym. And this is, a, this is a family show, so I shan't define it for you. And so there's always a problem of moving men and equipment and the whole logistical nightmare. They were hours late in leaving. The countryside knew they were coming. And on the way back, when they get to Concord, they're in Concord at 8 a.m. They were supposed to be back before daybreak. In fact, at Lexington, when they rode into Lexington, as dawn was just beginning to break over, you know, over Lexington Center, that some of Percy's, no, some of Smith's officers said, they know we're here. The whole night that they've been ringing church bells, I mean, Revere was riding, Prescott was riding, Dawes was riding, the whole countryside was alert, and they could hear the signaling, musket fire. And this was a, this was a victory for preparedness, and what, and what, and what, Smith ran into was a military engagement that he had never inspected, expected at all. He punched his fist into a hornet's nest. On the way back, they were laying for him, and he had no artillery. The men were moving lightly. They only brought with them a, a, uh, enough ammunition for 18 rounds, if you will, out and back. They were not prepared. 
for the battle that they ran into, outnumbered, overmatched, outgunned, and they broke. And about a third of his army was shot down or captured or wounded in the, on the return back to Boston. And when they returned, they chased the British soldiers back into Boston. And we've got about 15 or 16,000 colonial militiamen who are having the time of their lives, by the way, that um, this, is, this is good stuff. You know, we're hunting redcoats, and we had very few casualties. And as Gage, as Gage takes the, well, you want to read something interesting, that read Lieutenant Colonel Smith's official report to General Gage. Now, this is one officer reporting to another officer, his senior officer. And Smith is furious that these men are cowards, that not once did they stand and fight like I wanted them to, to stand up to a line of British regulars, a volley and then a bayonet charge, and that 17-inch bayonet, bang, right in the belly, boom, right through the throat. They fought from behind walls, and, and they fired from trees. They fired down on us from rooftops, you know, out of the windows of homes in Arlington, monot monotomies as, as it was known. And that's why in, in Arlington, it was a real bloodbath as the Brits went house to house, you know, cleaning out the, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the sharpshooters, the snipers, in the windows, on the rooftops. And, and as he said to his boss, not once did they stand and fight. What a surprise. Joseph Warren, and you can pull this down on the internet, it's one page. It's an after action report. If you're in the military or you're a police officer, that if there's a situation, you write for your lieutenant, whoever the lieutenant is that night, or the captain, or whom, if you're in the military, it's called an after action report. This is what happened. This is how I saw it. This is how I experienced it. Joseph Warren, who will die at Bunker Hill, he wrote not for a superior officer, he wrote for the other 12 colonies. He wrote for the imperial patriots of the Mass Bay Colony. He wrote for our friends in Great Britain. And it's a wonderful piece of propaganda. It's beautiful that we were so noble, you know, that we were just defending our natural rights. And they rushed on us and gunned us down. It's a wonderful piece of propaganda to enlist aid and sympathy and support. Smith is telling Gage, they were laying for us. Somebody ratted us out. They knew we were coming. And there is a mole inside your official body that somehow let Paul Revere and others know we were coming tonight, April 18th, April 19th. And there's always been some speculation that that mole inside Gage's headquarters was his wife. And you can do with that as you like and do your own research. In fact, he thought it was. And he sent her on the first ship back to Great Britain. You have betrayed the king, you have betrayed the empire, madam, and you have betrayed me. I'll roar you down, woman. So there's always a great deal of circumstantial evidence that it was Margaret. And Margaret was a closet patriot. General Gage knew the position of the, of the colonists. He heard it every night. <laughs> Darling, I get my paycheck from the king. I know, but we share a pillow. So he's caught in another type of trap, isn't he? So what Gage does when he sends Margaret back to England, he also sends his fastest cruiser to England Mayday, 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 SOS, SOS, I need help. I am surrounded, I am cut off, I am captured in Boston, I have nowhere to go. If these men charge over Boston Neck, which I have heavily defended, it's the only way in, only way out by land. If they come over Boston Neck, it's gonna be a bloodbath. I might lose Boston. I'm outnumbered three to one, four to one. And at night he could see those burning campfires as they grew and continued to encircle Boston to the left and to the center and to the right. Mayday, 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 I need help. And when Gage's superiors got this message, they, they questioned the iron in this man's spine. These are rabble. The, the, this is the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. 
You have the most professional army in the world. Nobody can stand up to a British bayonet charge. What, he's lost his will. And, and three generals will be sent to reinforce him, along with reinforcements. And we know all of these names from the American Revolution. General Howe, who was a brilliant tactician, didn't have a good day at Bunker Hill. Uh, General Howe, uh, General Clinton, and General Burgoyne. We know all of those names, don't we? Clinton, Howe, and Burgoyne. Get to Boston, reinforce Gage, put some iron in that man's spine, and let's clear the streets of this rabble. So while Gage waits, and he sees the campfires of the colonial militia growing and growing and, and, and the numbers increasing rapidly, and, and very much concerned, very much concerned that if this rabble gets up on my right, you know, onto the high ground along Charleston, and they get cannon up there, that all of Boston will be exposed to, to patriot, not, we wouldn't call them patriots, to rebel fire. And also, if they sink my ships, if they, if they sink the transports, the troop transports, I'm stuck. You know, I've got nowhere to go. I either surrender or die. So um, the situation is spinning out of control not as it would today, almost by, but certainly spinning out of control as the days became weeks and months. Now this is what? This is in May of 1775. George Washington will not show up in Boston and to Cambridge until July of 1775, you know, the month after Bunker Hill. So as Clinton, Howe, and, and Burgoyne arrive and they sit down and they look at the map and they strategize, there's no such word, just strategize. As they analyze the situation, their initial plan, and they get preempted on this, and it was a good plan, their initial plan was to grab the high ground at Dorchester Heights, get some men up there, get some men up on the Charlestown Peninsula, and then in a pincer movement, you know, come down from Dorchester Heights and hit, well, Roxbury and get into Dorchester come down from Charlestown, get into Cambridge, and take care of this rabble, run them out of town. They are rabble. They are merchants. They're farmers. They're young boys. And I should tell you, they're having a wonderful time because, you know, I can, can't you imagine them saying, hey, Ma, I'm away from home for a while, or to his girlfriend or his wife, I'm protecting your liberty, darling, and I'll be back as soon as I can. Because in, Cham in Cambridge, they were having a wonderful time drinking, playing cards, you know, raiding into barns and grabbing poultry and cows and, and having a wonderful feast and shooting the town up and pulling down fence posts, bonfires, shooting geese out of the air. They were having a wonderful time. It looked like a, it looked like a tailgate party, if I can use a contemporary term. And that's just how Washington viewed it when he showed up after Bunker Hill, and he, this is my army? This is my army? Remember, when Washington was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, that it was an army of one. He was it. And now I have to go up to Yankee land and take control of these militia. And when he showed up, this is my army? This is a, this is a Boy, Scout, Boy Scout outing. And they haven't even dug latrines. So you can just imagine the health problem there. And the other thing is, they expect to elect their officers? What kind of fresh hell is this? You elect your officers? You address them by their first name? I'm General Washington. That's another story for another time. You know, to, to, to whip this rabble, you know, in, into an army. So before he's arrived, and engage, and, and the others are working out their strategy, there is, before they can move down from Dorchester Heights and Charlestown, that the colonials have drifted from Cambridge down the Charlestown Peninsula. And this will be, and this will be Prescott, and this will be Israel Putnam, and these are amateurs. They're patriots, they're full of courage, but sometimes it takes more than courage to carry the battlefield. And so their instructions are to take possession of Bunker Hill. That's the map. 
and, and, and to see if they can roll in some cannon and menace Gage's troops in Boston and perhaps compel a withdrawal. Evacuation day has come and gone, hasn't it? That withdrawal will come in, in, in 1776. So, so the, the colonials move in, about 1,500 of them. And these are, these are ragtag guys. And they have, they've got hunting muskets with them. I mean, these aren't, you know, these aren't weapons that they, can, they cannot accommodate a bayonet. I mean, the Brits use the, the rifle stock and one volley, and then get into the line in bayoneting. A British soldier was well trained in using the stock of the weapon, click, turn, stick, to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy. And it's a good stick. It's in the throat where you bleed out quickly, or it's in the abdomen where you bleed out even more quickly. This isn't something in the arm unless you get pushed from another direction. It's a lethal stick with a 17-inch bayonet. So the next time you're doing the barbecuing, think about getting skewered with that, you know, right through the throat, and then getting up and say, excuse me, I think I, I, think I need to go to the doctor. Uh, I mean, these were, these were lethal weapons. And, and the strategy of the Brits always was that to get in close, and a musket had a range. A musket didn't have any range. And that musket ball went in any direction. But typically, the, 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 the standard procedure that a musket might have a range of a couple of hundred feet. Uh, and that's about the best you can do. And then what you want to do is you want to move in toward the line and, and trigger a, a rapid volley by the enemy. And then in all that smoke, suddenly come roaring out of the smoke with the bayonets. And, and, and yelling as you charge. And you know oftentimes, if you've taken basic training, part of it is yelling, isn't it? To yell and to get yourself worked up and to frighten the enemy. You know, to yell at the top of your voice and to give you coverage. So before anybody can reload, you come out of that billowing smoke yelling. You have that red uniform on. You've got that tall hat on so you look like you're 10 feet tall and not 5'3" which was about the average height of, a, of an infantryman, and get in that line, club and stick, and you've done. You're done with it. That's it's not going, well, it will happen eventually at Bunker Hill. So when they get to Bunker Hill, we're going to change. We're going down to Breed's Hill. Breed's Hill is, is important for two reasons. Number one, we get a better visual angle off to our left where the beaches are, because yeah, the Brits, if the Brits lined on, I'm at the top of Bunker Hill, Breach Hill. If the, and the Brits are gonna, the Brits are gonna land on the, on the beach. If they're on the left and we're on Bunker Hill, we don't have a good angle, good side angle is wrong. If we're on Breach Hill, we can see where they're landing and we can see if they're coming up on our left. And Breach Hill puts us a little bit closer to Boston Harbor as well. So we can lob some shells down on those ships or maybe on the town itself. So we wanna move down. So Gage gets up one morning before, before he can even think about getting up to Dorchester, and he's, he's the guy, he's the, the lead general, and get up on Charleston, on the, uh, on the Charlestown Peninsula, they're dug in. And I can just imagine him having his field glasses and, you know, swinging across in the morning and swinging over here. They're there. They're dug in. They're already there. These rebels have dug in. They've stolen a march on me and we've got to clear them off. If they get in and get dug in and get any kind of cannon up there, it's going to be a difficult day for this man's army in, 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 in Boston. So Cl General Clinton, who was the best strategist of the bunch, how was a good guy on the ground, maneuvering men around, leading from the front? Clinton. As he, as he looked at it, said, so General Gage, the best way to deal with this, never mind attacking Breed's Hill. Let's get some troops down on, let's land some troops behind the redoubt. Let's land some troops behind Breed's Hill. And to cut them off, the only line of retreat for the Patriots, unless they could swim the Atlantic, the only line of retreat was back down, back, back, 
come up out of Breeds Hill and back down Charlestown in, into Cambridge. That's the only line of retreat. Let's get troops there, seal off the line of retreat, bring in some regulars on the beach, squeeze them from both sides. It's the hammer and anvil approach. You know, the troops pound the retreating en enemy on the anvil. Uh, D General MacArthur, the, the, think of the Pusan perimeter, the Korean War. The anvil and the hammer. The hammer will be the troops coming up the hill. The colonials will run after we've had this bayonet charge. When they run, they're going to run right into the anvil, and we will be there, and we will be the anvil that you will crush the colonials on. It'll be over. Peace. We will t have taught them a lesson. End of story. That's what should have been done in retrospect. But Gage is angry. You have cut down a third of my men at Lexington and Concord. Oh, and by the way, you know what he's been doing? This is an early form of biological warfare. What Gage has been doing is that anybody that contracts uh, smallpox in Boston, he's putting them on rowboats and having them mailed to, uh, rowed to the Cambridge side and see if he can affect these militia with smallpox. And it's successful, because by the time Washington shows up a few months later, half of these guys are down with smallpox. It's too late for them, but he orders the rest of the, of the army to be inoculated. And, and, and that was a problematic decision when you think about it. It's counterintuitive. By that I mean to inoculate somebody with the disease to, to safeguard them against the fatality of it, if you will or the disfigurement of it. So an early form of biological warfare. Gage wants no part of anything subtle like that. The enemy is there. I want to teach them a lesson. I want a frontal assault. And I want to stick them. I want this to be a bloody frontal assault. You, General Howe, sir, you are my best battlefield technician. And you, sir, will gather an army. And we will row that army across, in full view, across the Mystic River. And we're going to land on the beaches. And, and then you will determine the, the method of attack. Are you going to attack to, from the front, from the left, from the right? How are you going to plan this? And as Gage looked at the map, the plan was to land in front, to gather everybody's intention, and then also to have a sweeping, flanking movement from, well, I'm looking at you guys, you know, it would be from the colonial left. And that's why they were down on Breed's Hill to keep an eye on the beaches. Because Gage, put, uh, Howe put a, lot of, a great deal of his men down on the beaches to come around and to flank, to come in behind. I come up from the front, and we've got them, and it's over. And this rebellion has been crushed. And we, we will suffocate it right here in Boston. Well, the colonials on, on, on the redoubt on Breed Hill, they saw what he was doing. And they moved men down onto the beach in, in, in anticipation. And they, they took rocks, rocks right out of the beach and piled them up. You know, we're going to lay behind the rocks. And then the tide went out. <laughs> so, oh, no, they can get around us again. Can you imagine not, not thinking about low tide and high tide? And suddenly the tide went out, so we've got to run that wall out even farther. And, and Gage is there. And on the left, that, that attack is blunted. And, and Gage, it's June, June 16, June 17. And it is a hot day. It's a hot, muggy day. These men are in full dress uniform. And they have a full kit. And the word kit is still to use. It's what you carry in your knapsack. They were carrying 80 or 90 pounds of stuff. You know, they had bread and food for three days. They had three days' worth of ammunition. And they have their long muskets, if you will. They have their long field pieces. They're, rifle. They're not called rifles yet. And they're ready to go. And there's that rabble up there. It's a steep hill. And the hill is encumbered with rocks and fences, so it's not as if it's a 100-yard sprint and, you know, at, the, at, some, at the track at Boston College. This is a slog uphill in thick grass. It's a hot day. What's also added to the heat and the, and the, the, um, and the acridity of the air is that the, the, British have, uh, the, the British have bombarded Charlestown the city itself, the town itself, because they were taking sniper fire. 
So they were sending into the town. It's an all wooden town. Uh, they were sending in what's called hot shot, which is simply burning pitch, and then carcasses, which is a hollowed out cannonball with firing with with with, with pitch that's been set on fire that's lit, and and Charlestown is burned to the ground. And as this battle unfolds, everyone is up on the rooftops watching this. And we know, don't we, that Abigail Adams, that uh, the young uh, John Quincy Adams, is watching this assault, you know, up Breed's Hill. And John Quincy Adams never, ever participated in any celebration of the Battle of Bunker Hill because their family physician, Dr. Joseph Warren, was cut down. And he could never bring himself to go back and be any part of that visitation. You can go to the spot, not you, one. One can go to the spot in Quincy and stand where Abigail stood with John Quincy. Now, your sight line is completely obliterated for the most part, but you can stand where they stood. It's always nice to do that. You can feel it come up through the soles of your feet, if you will, with a little imagination. Abigail Adams stood here. John Quincy Adams stood here. And they watched what I think I can see between the buildings. And only we can do this in Boston. What are the great things we have? We trip over history in this town. We trip over history in this colony. They don't have that stuff in Nebraska. They got corn. They got cows. They got game. The corn huskers. And that's it. Then everybody goes to bed or listen to the CB radio. Not my idea of a good time. So next time you're in the Quincy area, it's, I mean, it's, it's marked, you can find it, and stand there. The sight line is, is not correct, the, but, pardon me? What's the name of the uh, village there? It, the na it, I, it begins with a P. Okay. You can find it. All right. In fact, give me a ring, I'll show you where it is. Right. Actually, just ask, the, ask your um, map quest. Oh. So, so how was there? These men have their full kit on. I'm going to teach these guys a lesson. Up you go. Up you go. So up goes that first group. And they're getting closer and closer. And, and we are not going to fire too quickly. And I, can, and I can imagine this with me. And you can hear them coming. You can hear the drummer. You can't see them yet because of the, the pitch, but you can hear the drum. You know, these young boys, 12 or 13, the cadence for those men, moving quickly, long, purposeful steps up that steep incline. And I can just imagine, you know, you're, you're there and you can hear them, and then you see the top of the hat, and then you see their full breast, and your officers, hold, 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 fire, 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 and they lay down a blistering blast. The, the Brits had not expected such concentrated fire. Down they went, tum tumbling down the hill. How's blood is up here? We're going to re regroup down on the beach. Here they come again. Here they come again. And it was, you know the phrase, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. All right. I mean, that's cute. And it's, it's sophomoric. And it works for Disney. Where the white came from is that the officers had gone out and, and put, they, they'd taken parts of their shirts, I don't know, and ripped off pieces of white cloth and stuck them in the ground. When they get to that line, that's when you fire. So the whites of their eyes is where those cloth markers were. And these men are nervous. They're merchants, they're farmers, they're tailors, they're tinkerers. This is the mighty empire sent Caesar. And here they come again. Load, hold, 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 fire. And down they went again. Gage, I'm taking that hill. We are taking that hill. And how, I mean, these guys are telegraphing back and forth. I'm taking signal by mirrors. We're taking that hill. And, get, and, and how didn't have to be told that. Tells this guy, strip down, take off all the weight. We're going up. We're going up with fixed bayonet. We're going up with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with our rifles loaded, our muskets loaded, and we're going to run up that hill. By this time, on the top of the hill, there's been casualties. By this time, on the top of the hill, the men are out of, they're out of powder. They are, they've run low on powder. And here they come again, or it looks like they're going to come again. Can you imagine the tension? 
A lot of guys simply said, you know what, I'll go for help. I'll be right back. That would be me. You know, here they come again. Right? I'll be right back. I'll go for help. And a lot of guys went right down the Charlestown Peninsula and kept running into Connecticut. I don't know. I'm going to go for help. They're down to the issuing powder, the rationing, rationing powder, you know, a quarter a qu you know, or, or a half of a, of a ration of powder. And they're also, they've, some of the men have run out of musket balls. So they're grabbing whatever they can to, to, to pump down that, you know, they, to, to push down that musket. And some guys are taking stones and, and, and their metal buttons off their shirts. I can imagine some guy taking the zipper out and, and some poor soldier back in Boston saying, some guy saying, well, what did you get wounded by? I got wounded by a zipper. I got somebody's dental plate. <laughs> Using whatever they could do as a projectile. And so here they come again. And this time they get into the line and the line breaks and the Brits carry the hill. And that's when the clubbing and the bayoneting. That's when Joseph Warren goes down. And Joseph Warren had no business being there. Um, he had three children, maybe four, I don't remember, all of whom were under the age of 10. He had no business being there, but he wanted to be there with the guys, not as an officer, but in the line. And in fact, he was so badly either bludgeoned or beaten with the, or part of his face, you know, taken off with a musket ball or a couple of rounds, that in the spring, so, in, in the, so they were all buried there. So in the following spring of 76, when there was some disinterment to, to try to identify the dead, and this is an early crime scene investigation, CSI, Paul Revere, who wasn't there, but had done Joseph Warren's dental work, was able to identify him by the dental work. This is the guy. Uh, we can't recognize him. He's been on the ground for a while, and his face has been badly pummeled, but this is the guy, and I can tell by the dental work. And we know that today that is done in certain, in, in a forensic way as well, isn't it? So we don't think of these things, that these men knew each other. And, and Warren went down and with three or four children, you know, under the age of 10. The colonial scatter, and when Howe calls for casualty reports, it is horrific. He lost over half of his men at the Battle of Bunker Hill. The Battle of Bunker Hill is the bloodiest single day of the American Revolution. The Battle of Bunker Hill claimed the lives of 25% of the officers on the ground that day. Those numbers will never be replicated again. Never again will the British charge Americans dug in that way. Howe will never do it. Every one of his personal staff was either killed or wounded in that last assault up Bunker Hill. Gentlemen, gentlemen, charge. Gentlemen, I will see you at the top. I can just imagine that, can't you? We are going to clean the rabble off the top of this hill. And as General Nathaniel Green said from a Quaker, who was a very good military guy, General Nathaniel Green, who was one of Washington's finest commanders, by the way, you know, made the rather droll observation, oh, we'll sell them a hill at this price any day. They lost half their men. The American casualties were three or 400. They lost half their guys. Gage is quickly dispatched back to England. He's done. He's retired. I've got an issue with my wife, all right? He's retired. And now Howe is the commander. Washington has made his way up to Boston and taken command of this rabble as best he can. And, and, and Washington is considering you know, whether or not to launch a frontal assault against, against, against the Brits, go right over the, the neck. Or maybe come in from the side. You know, when, the, uh, when the tide goes out to assault, to come over the mudflats. But he thinks, re reconsiders this. The tides around here are tricky. What if I get troops out there and suddenly the tides come in and, you know, and the Brits lay down an artillery barrage? I mean, so, so we're going to wait and, and see how, how things work out. And he also sent troops up to, he sent, well, he sent Benedict Arnold up to take the city of, the, uh, the city of Quebec where he is very grievously wounded. But he also sends, 
he also sends Henry Knox, right, and up to Ticonderoga. And Knox, who was his military guy, in the only training Knox had in the use of artillery was what he read in, in books that he ordered for British officers. He was a bookseller. He was Amazon.com in Boston. And he ordered the books for, this, for the officers about, tech, about how to use artillery and new, and new strategies and so forth. So before he passed them along, he read them. So he was a, a self-taught officer, a self-taught artillery guy. So he drags these cannon back. And you look at what he did today, it's, it's incredible. You know, what these, you know, what these guys were able to pull off and puts them in on Dorchester Heights and, and Howe, who had hoped to be able to take Dorchester Heights again, when the cannon, to, and the only reason he didn't attack Dorchester Heights was a Northeaster came through and I canceled that operation. And then, and then uh, Knox got the cannon up on Dorchester Heights and and, and, Gal, and, and General Howe gets, gets a hold of Admiral Graves. Can you lay some artillery down there? Can you just put some cannon fire up there? Can you knock those guys out of there? Put some grape shot up there? The problem was his, the, he could not elevate his guns high enough to, to get those, that grape shot and get that artillery up to Dorchester Heights. I can't, get, I can't get the right trajectory. Furthermore, once these guys get dug in, they're going to take my ships out, they're going to take your ships out, and we're stuck here. You know what? Let's get out of town. Let's evacuate. Evacuation day. Let's evacuate Boston. So the word goes out all over to George Washington. I know you want Boston. And you know there'll be a bloodbath if you try to come over the, you, you try to come over Boston neck. Tell you what we'll do. Let's see if we can cut a deal here. I will evacuate Boston if you promise not to attack, and General Gates said, uh, General Washington said, okay, you can evacuate Boston, and I won't, I won't enter Boston until Boston has been cleared of British troops, and you, General Howe, in return, will promise not to burn the city to the ground, the town to the ground. Um, the Brits were really good at burning. So I'll let you get out. You promise not to burn, and we'll call a deal. So this is evacuation day. Now, Washington really cleaned up on this because as Howe readied his transports to bring the troops up to Halifax, that's going to win you some money on a quiz show. All right, I mean, that was a final Jeopardy answer. You know, we're, what, what, you know Halifax was the answer. Actually, I want some money to borrow on that. Halifax, uh, to withdraw to Halifax in Nova Scotia. Now, for Washington, there was an unintended boondoggle in this is that there were so many thousands of loyalists who wished to leave with the British Army that Howe had to leave on the docks in Boston tons of supplies to make room for loyalists who could not bear the thought of being an occupied Boston by the rabble, imperial patriots, and that we will be back. You know, the empire will strike back. So how? withdraws to Halifax to await further orders. Washington marches into, into Boston unmolested. Artemis Ward was really the senior guy, had been the prior senior guy, and he lets Ward be the first guy into Boston. And, what, and everybody's a little concerned because when the British evacuate, they, they keep their warships and their, and, their, and their troop transports within view of the harbor. And they're, move, they're maneuvering back and forth for three or four days. And the warriors, they're going to come back in. Or the warriors, they're going to land down in Braintree and come in from the other side. Well, Howe wasn't about to do that at all. He was just waiting for the wind, you know, for the right wind direction to be able to get up to Halifax and await further orders. And those further orders will be, will be forthcoming. Now, General, ha General Howe, that you will proceed to New York Harbor. And you will be joined by your brother, Admiral Howe, and that we will take New York City, which is just teeming with loyalists, we'll cut the rebellion in half by taking New York City, and then we'll deal with that. We'll, we'll divide the rebellion, and we'll see where we are once we take New York City. So in 17, Washington gets his orders to evacuate Boston. 
you know, when General Howe sails out of Boston, the war leaves Boston. The war leaves the Mass Bay Colony for all time. So much of it started here, didn't it? You know, beginning with the, the Boston Massacre, if you will, or the tarring and feathering of, of tax collectors. And then everything left when Howe went north to Halifax. And now to get to New York, split the rebellion, New York is, lo is teeming with loyalists, and Washington gets his orders from the Continental Congress to proceed to New York and to deal with the, the British threat. As he said, it'll be over by Christmas. Well, what was over by Christmas was his occupation of Boston and his occupation of New York. He was running for his life after he got pushed out of, out of New York. So the Howe brothers, Admiral Howe and General Howe, it's nice to keep it in the family, isn't it? It's like the Dallas brothers, Secretary of State Dallas and, Sec and Director of the CIA, Alan Dulles. And what Great Britain does here, and I'll close it down, we can do some thoughts you might have, what the king orders here, what Lord, Lord North orders here, this is a show of force. This is to intimidate. This is a show of force. This is the largest military expedition that any nation will send anywhere in the world in 1776 when they sail for New York. It's the largest military expedition in the history of the world to absolutely terrify New Yorkers and crush the rebellion. The empire will strike back. Great Britain will not send a larger military force anywhere in the world again to exceed that number. That number will not be exceeded until, <clears throat> until the Brits sail to North Africa in 1942 to chase down the desert fox. <clears throat> so I think that's a measure of the king's frustration, a measure of Lord North, and we are going to hammer this rebellion into oblivion in New York. Go, go, go. And when, the, <clears throat> when Admiral Howe showed up, and there were 400 ships, and you can imagine coming up over the horizon, dozens and dozens of sails, you know, flying the Union Jack, and the Empire has struck back, and, and how and how brought up the, uh, how, Admiral Howe brought up the rear, and as, as the flagship arrived, the smaller frigates and warships all thundered in ovation, you know, boom, 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 you know, that, the, that Howe was here. And, the, and, and loyalists on the rooftops, loyalists on the, on, the, on, on the piers shouting and waving and cheering, cheering. And then there was silence, the deafening silence as all that smoke cleared. And it will be General Admiral Howe in his flagship rolling off a 64-gun salute. Boom, boom, boom. Must have been spectacular. The window's rattling. The empire is here. And I'm saluting my Navy, and I'm saluting the Loyalists. And where is, where are those rebels? Harlem. Yeah, they're in Harlem, they're in Brooklyn. Uh, George Washington makes every rookie mistake that any commander could make. What saved him was the weather, and what saved him was the, the men of Marblehead. You know, the, uh, the, the mariners, the sailors of, of Marblehead and getting, getting Washington over that East River so he could retreat up Manhattan and run for his life, you know, down to the Delaware. So, so there's our story. And, and we know the rest of that story. So what happened for Washington, one more thing, is Washington wanted a trained army. And after the Battle of Bunker Hill, it was so hard to convince Congress to provide him with a trained army. All you need is a rapid gathering of eagles. You don't need a trained army. Put the word out. We'll be fighting the British on Wednesday, you know, you know, uh, you know uh, August 17th. Everyone will show up, and we'll have another Bunker Hill. And what happened was, it was, as, you know, that we, that farmers, loyal, patriotic, dutiful farmers, men of the soil, men of the plow, can take on any soldier, any army, no matter how skilled they are, they purport to be, because we fight not for a paycheck. We fight for a nation. We fight for a purpose. We fight because we are honest men from the plow, and we will take our muskets and defend our land, defend our wives, and defend our children, and then go home. And, and Washington said, you got lucky. You got lucky. 
Howe made mistakes. You got lucky. I need a standing army. Now you don't. It took a while for him to be able to get his standing army. So it will be, it will be the dash to the Delaware and, the, and to reignite, if you will, the, the American Revolution with, with come from behind victories at Princeton and Trenton. And then the great victory at Saratoga, come the French. And then what finally polished everything off was when General Cornwallis surrendered at, at Yorktown in October of 1781. This is 1775. And meanwhile, Thomas Jefferson is putting together what he said was an expression of the American mind, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he was exaggerating. It was the expression of some Americans, not an expression of the American mind. And he, and he, and he weaved together a narrative, and this is a different chat for another night, unless we, we've done it. He weaved together a narrative of a common history of 13 colonies that never had a common history. And he did a good job that we do have a common history here. And that you bricklayer in Boston have as much in common with a, with a slave-holding aristocrat in Virginia, more than you think. And that's when he laid it out in the, the attack on the king. I don't want to get into all of that. That's a rich story. If I rush it, I'll be unhappy with myself. All right, so, so it will be the, the fishermen of Marblehead and the weather that will get Washington out of a jam in New York. And then off to the Delaware. And, and Thomas Paine, th those great bulldozing words of Thomas Paine. And Washington asked him to write a motivational essay, if you will. And Paine could do it. And you know the words. These are the times that try men's souls. That the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot have left. When it was fun to march. When the weather was dry. When the when, the, when the, the food was ample, when the women were at the roadsides cheering and running up to give you a bus on the cheek. Those men are gone. They were the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot. But now he that stands the course deserves the love and affection of men and women. We don't need these men. We have boiled down to these recruits and we're on the edge of the Delaware River Howe was right behind Washington, offering terms of surrender. And now what do we do? I didn't bargain for this. Now what do we do? And Washington, I'll see this through. I'll see this through. We've got to get across the Delaware. And he did, didn't he, eventually. So let me stop here. An observation, a question. Bunker Hill, I don't advocate anybody racing up those steps. You're going to have a coronary. It's easy coming down. It's gravity. Getting up is the tough part. 